Grace and peace to you and welcome on this feast day of the Pentecost. We are 50 days at the end of our Easter season and we hear the story of the disciples gathered together and receiving the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. So everything is focused on the Spirit today. Uh, we begin our worship with the prelude. Today's prelude, if you'll bear with me, does make sense with today being Pentecost. Uh, when I was thinking about the Tower of Babel, and as our reading says today, that all the people spoke one language, I was reminded of the Longfellow quote that music is the universal language. Um, there is a composer named Samuel Coleridge Taylor who composed a series of pieces based on Longfellow's poem, Song of Hiawatha. So today I'm going to be playing one of a selection of one of the pieces from Samuel Coleridge Taylor's um, suite on Song of Hiawatha. Thank you. 
You may remain seated for our confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore, our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam, What What Father father so tender tender is calling calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our Our sins, sins, they they are many. His His mercy mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, darkness, new new every morn. Our Our sins, sins, they they are many. His His mercy mercy is more. Please. Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as you once sent the promised gift of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples long ago, stir up that Spirit in us this day, that embracing our own empowerment, our passion for the faith will be rekindled and we will eagerly turn to your word, declare your good news, and witness to your grace through our own works of mercy, love, and compassion. We ask this through your Son, Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. A reading from Genesis. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, let's do this. Let's break bricks and heat them until they are hard as stone. So for them, these brick stones were like our building stone. And raw bitumen was for them like our mortar. Now they said, Let's do this. Let's build ourselves a city and a tower as tall as the heavens. This will be how we will make a name for ourselves, and because of our fame, we will not need to scatter abroad over the face of the earth. As the people started their construction projects, Yahweh, God, came down to the city and tower that the humans were building. Yahweh said, Well, look what we have here, one people with one language for them all. Now they decide that they want to make a name for themselves so they don't have to follow my plan and scatter abroad the face of the earth. Well, this is the only the beginning of what they will do. There is nothing to stop them in all that they might scheme to do. So let's do this. Let's go down there and let's baffle their language so that no one will understand the language of their neighbor. In this way, Yahweh, God, scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth, and they all had to stop building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, for there Yahweh baffled the language of all the earth folk, and from there Yahweh scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. The word of the Lord. A reading from 1 Corinthians. What about the spiritual, brothers and sisters? I do not desire you to be unknowledgeable, for do not forget that before you became followers of Jesus, you were being led in the wrong direction and guided by speechless idols. Therefore, I am teaching you that no one speaking in the Spirit of God says, Jesus is nothing. 
And also no one has the power to say, Lord Jesus, if not empowered by the Holy Spirit. However, even though there are varieties of giftedness, they come from the same spirit. And even though there are a variety of servant roles, they serve the same Lord. And even though there are a variety of motivational energies, it is the same God energizing everyone and everything. So each of us is given the manifestation of the spirit for the sake of the common good of the community. One of us might be gifted with words of wisdom through the spirit, and another of us may be gifted with the utterance of knowledge from the same spirit, and another might be gifted with the faith by the same spirit, and another might have gifts of healing from the one spirit, and another might be gifted with the working of miracles. To another might be gifted with prophecy, and another might be gifted with the discernment of spirits, and another might be gifted with the various kinds of tongues, and another might be gifted with the interpretation of tongues. But all this energizing is by the one and the same Spirit who divides us out these gifts to each of us individually as the Spirit determines. For just as the body is the one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. The word of the Lord. Hello, hello. Oop. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good morning. Hello. So anybody notice any special decoration up here this morning? Yes. That. Yeah. What is that? And what would you call it? An orb, yes. Is it just an orb orb or is there something special about it? Yeah, it's a flaming orb, isn't it? Yeah. Why do you think we have a flaming orb today? It's because it's Pentecost. And in just a minute, I'm going to read a story about Jesus' disciples receiving the Holy Spirit, and it came like a fire over their heads. Now, I want to talk just a few minutes about fire. Do you like fire? No, why don't you like fire? It can burn you. Yeah, you have to be really careful with fire. The same is true with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit that's given to you can get a little out of hand if you're not careful. You have to be very careful. But is fire good? Yeah, what kind of good things can you do with fire? Uh, when it's cold outside, it can warm you up. Yes. You can cook your food with fire. Yeah, fire can be really good. If you're in the dark, what can you do? You can light it up, right? These are all good things that fire does, and that's why we use fire to talk about the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is something that's good for us, too. It's something that can warm us up, and you can help warm other people. It can be a light in people's darkness. And, well, the Holy Spirit doesn't cook food, but it can nourish you in the faith and help you grow in the faith. So we use flame for that. But as you said, sometimes you have to be careful. It can get out of hand. So we have to learn how to use the Holy Spirit. Now, you all can use the Holy Spirit. It was given to you in baptism. You can use the Holy Spirit by, what could you do to show light in somebody's life? You could be nice to them, exactly. What could you do instead of cooking somebody's food? Although I'm sure you could cook somebody's food, but. Could you be nice to somebody as a way of making them feel warm inside? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I want you to think this week about how you have been set on fire by the Holy Spirit as a way to bring warmth and light and joy into people's lives. Thanks a lot for coming up.
Since the Pentecost event does not appear in any of the four Gospels, we turn instead to the book of Acts to hear the story of the Pentecost. When the Pentecost that was the fulfillment of what was promised came, Jesus' disciples were all gathered together in one place. And suddenly, a noise came out of heaven. It was like someone breathing a tremendously dramatic breath. It filled the entire house where they were sitting. Their eyes were opened to see dividing tongues, which, like when fire is divided, were not diminished when distributed. The tongues sat over each one of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak different tongues as the Spirit gave voice to them. But there were devout Jews from every ethnicity under heaven living in Jerusalem. And this sound developing, many of them gathered and were confounded because each one heard their own dialect being spoken by the disciples. Ecstatic and amazed, these Jews were saying, Look, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? then how are we all hearing what they are saying in our own native dialects? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, 
Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we are hearing them speaking in our own tongues of the greatness of God. Everyone was ecstatic and perplexed, saying to one another, Whose will is this? But there were others who sneered and said, They've been filled with sweet wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and declared to them, People of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and let my words come into your ears. Those of you hearing speak, those you hear speaking are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. And I will give wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And all who may call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, could you have told me the basic story of the Tower of Babel before he came to church this morning? Probably. I find that it's popular enough that even we Lutherans could give some kind of summary of what the story is about. It's not quite as popular as Noah's Ark or Adam and Eve or even David and Goliath, but it's still up there pretty high. And of course, the title helps, doesn't it? The Tower of Babel. Like Noah and the Ark. The title helps us know what the story is about. I suppose it'd be more helpful if it was Noah and the Ark and the animals and the Great Flood. Then we'd hit all the high points in the story. Or if it was David and Goliath and the sling and the stone, you wouldn't forget any part of the story. Not like if I asked you to tell me the story of Pentecost. Oh, at least the Tower of Babel gives us some clues as to what the story is about. You at least know it's about a tower and babbling, which incidentally, there's reasonable speculation that we get our meaning of that word from this story, though these days we usually use babbling to refer to what little babies do before they actually start making sense. And in the story, it's not that the people at the end of the story are babbling nonsensically. It's just that God has performed the miracle of making them speak the diverse languages of the world, while also not making it possible for everyone to understand all the diverse languages of the world. That miracle has been left up to Google Translate and Duolingo both of which I'm sure are technologies that some conservative Christian group somewhere is condemning as an abomination to what God had intended in the Tower of Babel episode. Which, of course, brings up the question, what did God intend at the Tower of Babel? Is it really just a story for us about the origins of all the languages that the world speaks? Sure, why not? I mean, as with most of the stories at the beginning of Genesis, the Tower of Babel story does answer the big question, why don't we all speak one language? And it's a good question. And for centuries, God's people have said, well, remember what happened at the Tower of Babel? 
which you know may have been a fine answer for us when we were back in Sunday school, right? But we've come a long way since Sunday school, and perhaps the answers we got then when we were eight years old aren't quite as satisfying to us now, after we've been to college and studied anthropology and sociology and maybe even linguistics. So let's take a few minutes and look at the story again, just to see if there is something else that we can take away from it. And let's begin by asking what's behind the traditional answer about what this story is about. And ask the question, why? Why did God decide to have everyone speak a different language? Now again, the title of the story helps us out here because that's the babbling part, but then there's also this tower, which makes this story really great for Sunday school, doesn't it? This tower. There's nothing like having a craft which is building a tower out of something, anything, and making it as tall as you possibly can make it. And it's a great pedagogical moment, hits all the high points, right? Because you've got reading comprehension, you've got project management, you've got learning to work together, you've got spatial relations. And the metric for success is so tangible that even our little concrete operational thinkers can grasp the concepts that are in the story. But it does raise the question, why again? Why are people trying to build a tower in the first place? Now, I know often it's said that they were trying to get to heaven, kind of like Jack and the Beanstalk, I suppose. And then, you know, God stops them because, what, God wants to protect God's privacy in heaven? Or is God really worried that when humans get to heaven, we're going to want to take over and run things our way, which God knows is not good, given our track record here on earth? But why are people in this story trying to build a tower? Well, let me ask you, anybody know what the tallest building in the world is? It's just over half a mile tall. Yeah? It is in Dubai. You're exactly right, Zach. It is in Dubai. And why is it in Dubai? Is it because Dubai, like Manhattan, just doesn't have enough space to spread out that it's got to go up? Of course not. It's in Dubai because Dubai has worked hard to make it no surprise to you that the tallest building in the world is in Dubai. They have worked hard to build an image of wealth and excess. And they've enhanced that image and enhanced their name by building the tallest tower in the world. And there is something about height that gives a place notoriety, isn't there? You know, how many of you have been to the top of the Empire State Building? Yeah. Did you go there because you had business to transact in an office on the 102nd floor? Probably not. There's something about tall structures that gives a place notoriety. Which is actually why we hear in the story that these people are building a tower. They're not trying to get closer to God in heaven. They're trying to make themselves more important here on earth. They're not focused at all at getting close to God. They're actually more focused on distancing themselves from God. We can see this from the very beginning of the story. Did you hear that at the beginning of the story, all the people gathered together on the plain of Shinar? That should be really alarming to us. That should have put you on the edge of your seats, wondering what is going to happen next, because we remember it was just a few pages back in the Bible, we heard God telling people that they needed to scatter abroad across the face of the earth. And here they are, gathering together, doing just the opposite of what God had planned for them. 
ignoring God's word to them completely. But of course that happens often, doesn't it? It's often that people think that we have a better plan than God does. It's often that we think we know better than God does, better how life should be lived, better how to take care of ourselves, better how to gain control over our destiny. We're smart. We're industrious. We have developed technology to the point where we can make life better, and at this point, it really seems like there is nothing that we cannot do. What do we need God for? A God especially who seems clearly behind the times. And sometimes that's a perspective we take even in our own lives, isn't it? Thank you, God. Really, I do appreciate all that you have done for me, but I think I can take it from here now. And we set about constructing and celebrating the towers that we want to build to confirm our self-reliance and our self-confidence and our self-determination. We distance ourselves from God, leaving God and God's word to the margins of our lives. So let me ask you, how do you think this Tower of Babel story would have ended if God had not intervened? Do you think humanity would have finished that tower? Do you think we would have become the gods on earth that we were seeking to be? Do you think we would have been able to create the good life for ourselves? If so, then the God of this story and the God of Pentecost is not for you. Because the God of this story and the God of Pentecost is a God who will continue to draw near to us even as we seek to distance ourselves from God. The God of these stories is not a God who abandons us to the hubris of our naive little schemes about how things should go. This God continues to seek ways to turn us from our navel-gazing back to looking for the way of faithfulness, the way of trusting and hoping in God's plan and God's word. This is the God who comes to us, seeking to have us stop looking at our own towers for salvation and instead keep our focus on the cross of Christ.
creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At the end of each petition, I will say, Gracious Lord, and your response will be, Hear our prayer. The story of Pentecost is a powerful narrative that illustrates how God perceives human diversity as a profound gift. We are called to recognize and celebrate the unique contributions each person brings to the world. Through the Spirit, God affirms that our differences are not only acknowledged, but are essential to the beauty and unity of creation. Heavenly Father, thank you for the example of those 12 faithful disciples who obeyed your word and were given the privilege of being involved in the actual birth of the body of Christ, the church, on that special and unique day of Pentecost. We, praise, we pray that, like them, we may listen to your commands and carry them unwillingly to your praise and glory. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. Thank you, Father, for this church where your spirit gathers us. May we be vibrant and welcoming community and embrace and celebrate the diverse gifts of all the members. Fill us with your love and help us to spread the gospel throughout the world. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you grant the gift of unity to our divided world, as demonstrated by the early believers who were joined together in one place. Help us to break down any walls of division and come together as one body, united in purpose and love, reflecting your glory to the world. May your spirit of understanding and reconciliation fill the hearts of all people. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, give us the ability to speak not in languages of hate greed, com complacency, or discontent, but in love, peace, mercy, kindness, in generosity and benevolence, in humility and patience, and truthful world of words of encouragement. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. Compassionate Father, be with those who are oppressed and suffering. Bring them comfort and hope move our hearts to work for justice and consideration. We especially remember those on Grace's prayer list and others that may weigh heavy on our hearts. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. And we ask that you hear the prayers that we humbly ask for ourselves, that we fill that you fill us with your grace and inspire us to live lives of holiness and service. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of our Lord be with you all. We share a sign of God's peace.
Let us pray. Living God, we we praise praise you for the abundant abundant blessings blessings of this this life. life. In In humble humble recognition recognition of the love you always show to us, we bring these gifts and ourselves as our thanks. Use them and us to bear the fruit of goodness and grace, so that your glory will be known to all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, fulfilling the promise of the resurrection. You pour out the fire of your Spirit, uniting in one body people of every nation and tongue. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter, and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. We give you thanks, Father, through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, whom you sent in this end of the ages to save and redeem us and to proclaim to us your will. He is the one who handed over to a death he freely accepted in order to destroy death, in order to break the bonds of the evil one, in order to crush hell underfoot, in order to give light to the righteous In order to establish his covenant and show forth the resurrection, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying to them, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for my remembrance. Then, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant. In my blood, it is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for my remembrance. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift of faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God.